Okay. Microphone open. Hello. Hello. Perfect. Fine. So, very warm welcome from us. We are from T-Systems. My name is Bernd Rederlechner. I am the lead architect for cloud integration at T-Systems. And I have Boris with me. Boris, introduce Hello. yourself. So, my name is uh, Boris Volkmann. I work as a senior multi-cloud uh, architect uh, together with Bernd at Global Systems Integration where we help our customers to onboard the cloud platforms of T-Systems International, Deutsche Telekom. And uh, I've done a very interesting project uh, over the summer where we migrated or even modernized um, a public broadcast company in, in Germany um, who's got a, a TV channel, radio channels, and a, a lot of things uh, online. And we moved those things uh, to the cloud. And from this, we derived the uh, show today, which is about continuous delivery to Open Telecom Cloud. And we are so proud to, to present two things today. We are so proud to present our, our public cloud offering, our German public cloud offering, the Open Telecom Cloud, on the one side. And on the other side, what you really can do with the things. Because what, what helps a platform where nothing runs on? And this is exactly our mission assist at systems integration. The systems is very well known to have this house of clouds where we have a lot of, and a bunch of things that you can have from us. You can have from us VMware things for a long time. We are already doing cloud integration, cloud migrations for about 10 years. And we started with VMware things. But mean, meanwhile, we have all these nice little things like Salesforce as software as service. We have Microsoft as a partner. We have Azure installations at our uh, computers, data centers in, in Biere. And if you think of the, the T-Systems House of Clouds as the, the preferred holidays you want to go, the Caribbean, then you need something like a plane to get there. And our goal is to be the plane to get there. And the, let's say the types of planes you can have could be very different. There is a very, very slow plane, easy plane, where you just take the application and make it run in the same way as it did before on-premise in the cloud. This is something we've already done for 10 years now, and it's a very well-known thing how you can do it, even for whole landscapes. And I will ta address later what it means to, to look at whole landscapes. And then you can go up to the Concorde, which means to, uh, to build the whole new, nice little um, cloud-native microservice hot applications on, on OTC. We know how to do each of these things, and especially we know how to do this for whole landscapes. And part of our mission is not to end up with even more complicated environments at the end, but doing the things in a way that the, 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 the customers really have benefit from it. They should not end up with more complexity than they have before. So this is the mission. And the Open Telecom Cloud as our core OpenStack product is becoming more and more the center of the strategy of the systems. So even though we have all these other cloud offerings around, the, the view of the systems becomes more and more that you should go to this, to this highly industrialized OpenStack with your main part of your, uh, of your infrastructure and we have it in more private flavors, and we have it in more public flavors, and we have it as a classical public cloud in the beginning. But you can then take all these other things around we have in the systems to get the whole picture. We'll see later on what this means. We will see this live later on, but this is the main page, the starting page of our Open Telecom Cloud. This is what, where you end up if you log in at the first time. And it shows perfectly well what the, what the offering consists of. You, of course, find all the classical things, maybe not named Neutron or Nova or whatever, but it's, it's, it's really what you expect from an OpenStack cloud. You have compute, 
You have networks, you have volumes, you have object storage, <coughs> which is a nice one. It's an S3 object storage, compatible and, and even handled in the same way as it does on the, on the EC2, on, the, on the Amazon Web Cloud. What we also have is then some infrastructure near platform service, I would call it. You have load balancers, you have domain <coughs> name services, you have VPN connections in two flavors. Because we are Deutsche Telekom, we know how to make networks, we know how to connect the world. So what we have is you can have on-demand IPsec VPNs to your, to your on-premise landscapes if you want to on a click. But what you can also have is fixed lines, MPLS, switched connections, high speed if you want to. And you can have click it here and the process of the provisioning starts. What do you think? Can yeah. Amazon offer something like this, Direct Connect? They try to offer the same way, but of course, they need partners for this. And if you take it from us, you get it from Deutsche Telekom. You get everything from one hand. No partners between. No shifting around. To <laughs> who is the one who doesn't, why it not work? No finger pointing. We are, we are T-count on me. What we also have is some basic platform services that go beyond infrastructure. And two things we are very proud of is we have the integrated cloud engine, the container engine, sorry, the cloud container engine. So we have containers on the platform. You can use them. We have relational database service. And we are very new. You can also have workspaces, which means these side trick things that you may have already seen your desktop in the cloud. But as I mentioned before, there has to be somebody who helps the people to get there. And we, when, when Open Telecom started, we thought about what is needed to help the people to get there. And we thought it's, it's, it starts with overcoming the initial barriers. So we, we are there if you want to do something on your own and you don't know why it doesn't work on OTC. And usually we, we are on, on short notice, we look at it and give you a hint why the OpenStack call does not work as expected on this platform and help you why, what, what, whatever is needed to get your OpenStack application running. On the business side, you have usually also the need to explain to customers why is it cheaper? Or why does it, cost, does it cost the way it costs? So you have to help them to compute the costs and to maybe even to show them how to use the cost calculator we have. You have online cost calculations, so you can, on the website, you can try out what your, what your infrastructure that you plan to use really cost. And then, it goes all the way, as we've shown before, from simple migration techniques to very, very elaborated modernization strategies, yeah, ending up even in hybrid cloud models that I'm not completely convinced of. I think you can have hybrids, but you should keep it, the number of clouds as small as possible. What we also have is we have a structured way to handle whole landscapes. And we have this usually two-level two approach that we are doing if we are coming to a customer and he says, I have 1,000 applications and I want to have them in the cloud. And we don't do, what we don't do is we, pick, we don't pick the cloud native ones and say, oh, fine, we're cloud native and we have fast the cloud. It's, it's all cool, it's all fine. What we say is everything goes to cloud. And level one is shifting the things all as they are to the cloud. And level two is learning the people how to iteratively and incrementally modernize the things. And because shifting the things as they are to the cloud is a boring job, we decided to industrialize the things. We've done this for 10 years, and we've seen a lot of projects where each and every project within the landscape, so each and every application in the landscape, decided a different way to migrate. 
He said, this cannot be the way. What we have is, we have a... Uh, Bound, the first people are leaving. We have to hurry up for the live okay. demo. <laughs> okay. About cloud native apps on okay. the right. And modernization. Then That's it. Go to the modernization, <laughs> of course. Okay. Boris, Next your slide. Turn. Next slide is your slide. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just what we seconds. do is, what we do is then, if we modernize, we look at the different concerns the people have and make packages and, and solve this concern on all the applications that have this concern. Typically, you maybe have poor availability, and then we have architecture patterns where we discuss with the customer the general solutions, and these, these blueprints contain <coughs> also then general cloud mechanisms you have to use. This could go as far as software as a service where you say, okay, why not migrate away from the, the, the things that you've built with the customer database to a modern CRM system like Salesforce. And one of the typical pro problems and the customer asked us, I have, a, I have seasonal births. Um, Boris can explain the seasonal births are very, very nice because they're very, very uh, understandable what they have for, as a problem. And we gave them the blueprint how to burst out to public. And now we show how we deliver the burst out okay. to public. Thank you. Okay, now I will tell you some things about uh, what we've done in this uh, real life customer project. Um, we've done a lot of work on ephemeral servers, so servers that uh, just live for a very short amount of time. Uh, we've built an image bakery. Um, using Ansible and Jenkins, and I will show you in the live demo how doing uh, rolling updates on the uh, Open Telecom Cloud. So a little bit about uh, pets versus cattle. Maybe you already heard about this. So these are two different uh, types of servers. So to the left we have this kind which is um, a pet to you. It's a long-living server, you really care for it. It's like your pet at home. You have a cat, you have a dog, but of course you don't have 10 or 20 pets. So that's the same with your pet service. You cannot really afford to manage all of them manually. But there are some important systems that you really care for. And if they're ill, you, you call the doctor and replace uh, the hardware. So I think this model also fits to the um, legacy IT world a little bit, like uh, the Samurai, for example, we saw yeah, yesterday. But if you look at our new systems, the only pet that's left over is our Ansible server, because we care a lot about this master server where we do all the, the deployments from, because yeah. Boris will show why, why yeah. this server is so important. But <clears> this is our only pet we have. All other servers, all other applications are just cattle. Yes. So this is a new type of server, cattle. One is like the other. If one cow is ill, sorry, we have to kill it. It's <laughs> even simpler. We just uh, create yeah. some new service. That's why we call them cattle. And uh, everything is automated in this world. And this is more of the agile ninja approach mm -hmm. for creating service. Well, and really, keep it this way. We don't go to the server and patch something there. It is killed and it's built, it is built again if it is necessary. We are always building from scratch, which makes life a lot easier. Okay, so let's uh, look at OTC. Uh, how do we handle images, server images? If you can see here to the left, we have a bunch of public images that we offer. Of course, we have more than this. Um, if you create a server, you say, okay, I want to have this uh, base image, then it's copied to the system disk and your server has started. But then you have the possibility to create on this server something really new. You can make your custom image and save this as a private image and you get this for free so we don't charge you for storing private images in your OTC tenant. And then afterwards you can use any image you want from your private images to create a new server. If you have created your image somewhere on your desktop PC, that's also possible. You can just upload it using the object store to the private images. And we have a new feature that is called shared images, which you can use to share images between hundreds of tenants, if you like. So how does the image bakery work and, and how do we work with ephemeral service? So we start with the base image and then in our staging and testing environment, we create our first server. 
let's say this is version zero because it is just based on the base image. So for example, it's the plain CentOS 7.2 that is available on the OTC. Then we log in into this server using Ansible, which is uh, just uh, using Secure Shell. Then we are installing things, changing configurations, uh, synchronizing files to the machines, and then we have version one ready. So we can save it as a private image to the uh, image management. And then later we can put this into production, and this is really a new server. It's not the same server that is in the staging and testing environment. Then, of course, it is possible to dispose the server that we used for create the image. It is no longer necessary to have it. And on the production side, we can, of, have, of course, have multiple servers of this kind. And then the process just starts again. We use now the, the custom image version 1 for the staging and testing system. We upgrade it to version 2 with our custom code. What do we want to change? Then we have this new image. And then the rolling update takes place, if, especially if it's an auto-scaling group um, behind the elastic load balancer. So the idea is that we have the old and the new version running simultaneously. We try to show this later. Then we switch off the old version. And uh, as the load balancer can handle this case, it doesn't uh, interrupt any internet connection to the systems. And so on. Same with version 3. That's how it works. Image bakery or image factory ephemeral service. So let's see what I've built Both for you one, today. One, one remark yeah. on the last slide. Just be aware, we do nothing on local systems. We do nothing on local laptops. We do everything in our cloud. We are, do, we are really building the images on the tenant itself. And it gives us a, a lot more power and, and, and a lot more degrees of automation than you can have on your local, de on your <coughs> local, uh, on your local laptop. Yeah. So I just step back so that you can uh, hear me talking to the, to the microphone. It's better this direction. So here we'll, you can see what I've built uh, today for you in OTC and even a little bit more. And it reflects a little bit the setup that we had for our customer. It's a simplified version, but it's enough for today. So what you see here is the typical end user that uses the web application. Um, he or she can use HTTP or HTTPS to access the, the OTC. So this block I call the OTC DMZ because here we have the elastic IPs that are accessible from the internet. So where, where do you connect to when you try to access the web page? Um, in fact, you're connected to the elastic load balancer. And uh, the elastic load balancer is capable of doing the SSL termination. So at this point, HTTPS has ended, so we can work internally just with HTTP. Here we have a VPC. It's called the uh, production VPC. You can see the, the sitter that was used. And a virtual private cloud, a VPC, uh, if you think about Neutron, it's like a router. You see it here, and it's a network. Is it just one network? Yes, it is. But we create sub-networks here. Mm -hmm. So the gray floor, the gray floors are uh, sub-networks that are running in different availability zones. Maybe for the hardcore OpenStack specialists. You know, in, in the public cloud setup, you have a little bit of a problem that you have to hand to mess around with public IP addresses and private IP addresses on a large scale. This is why the network model on our, on our OTC is a little bit diminished compared to what, it's, what really could be done in an OpenStack environment. We have this VPC concept, which is also available in Amazon. And you have a VPC, and everybody who belongs to VPC can have then one router in the middle, subnets behind, public uh, and public IPs that are then, uh, and that the router simply maps between the public IPs and the subnet IPs, and nothing much more. Yes. So on the VPC router, we have also the security group, which is basically a set of firewall rules, so we can explicitly deny or allow traffic. So what does the elastic load balancer? In fact, he load balances to all those instances. In this case, it's a simple Apache. And these uh, servers here, they are in an auto-scaling group. This is this one here. We have a number of uh, two instances, instances as a minimum. 
And then the rest, for example, can be dynamically scaled up and down depending on certain auto-scaling uh, policies. Let's say CPU load is too high, then we add another instance. Why do we have at least a minimum of two? Because we want to have the whole solution totally uh, high available. So the ELB is already high available. This is a system that in fact runs on both availability zones and this system keeps on running even if one availability zone is, is totally unavailable. So in this case, the ELB will just use the uh, service running in one of the other availability zones. Um, okay, so how does it work building the images? Here you see a typical workplace. This would be the DevOps team that is uh, staging the, the images. So what can we do? Of course, we can use the web front end uh, to um, access the OTC console. Um, in fact, this web UI more or less just does OpenStack calls and then handles everything, manages everything in the OTC. You have also the possibility using your browser to connect to the uh, remote console of your virtual service here. It's also an encrypted connection. So it is not absolutely necessary to use Secure Shell. So what did we then do? We have here this VPC for development. And the interesting thing is that we can build exactly the same network scenario than in the production VPC. What we do first is that we deploy a jump host here. This is the only machine that is accessible from the internet. It has an elastic IP, so we can connect to it using Secure Shell. And from this uh, jump host, we are creating the, the service. And we just need one because uh, it is a staging system just for uh, creating the image. What we do here, we install Ansible on it. So um, you can work directly here on the command line, uh, spawning all your servers here. Um, you can also, of course, uh, call the OpenStack API to create those virtual instances. And what we've done, especially in this project, is that we used um, a CI server, Jenkins, running um, at the customer site, as well as a JIT repository for infrastructure as code. And what we do is that the Ansible master, Boris? we call it an Ansible master. I'm so keen to see the yeah. Jenkins now, so please okay. start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's switch to the read thing. So we are talked a lot, but this is the real stuff. Yeah, okay. So we already uh, logged in to the um, OTC console. We can switch to the um, view where you can see the virtual uh, private clouds. L looks very different to standard OpenStack, but um, it's done for consumers. An analyst told us it's a real fine thing to, to, to do it this way. You find the things if you know OpenStack, but you, you have to be aware that it's not always there where you think it is. <clears throat> so what we currently see here is um, the BF production VPC, which I use for, for production. You can see the router here. We have the, the two different uh, subnets uh, running in these uh, two different availability zones. And then we can already see some machines here and here. So um, I have uh, created two auto-scaling groups to show different things if time, uh, time allows us. So and currently we have um, two machines uh, in each um, auto-scaler, which we'll see later. Then we can also have a look at the uh, development VPC. This is this one. I have a test machine here. This is um, the uh, staging server for the image, for the Apache image, and this is the existing um, jump host. And, and the jump host, of course, is also an image, so each, if you really kill our, our, our beloved pet, then we still have a clone of it. <laughs> yeah. So the first step would be to show you how easy it is to uh, create a new jump host and um, install Ansible to it so that we can use it as the Ansible control machine. So the Ansible guys usually call it a control machine. We, we call it the Ansible master. And then we'll try um, to show you how it can be very easily integrated to the uh, Jenkins master as a slave machine. Okay, on we go. 
So here you can create your Elastic Cloud service. We could also uh, set up some SAP with some clicks, but don't have time now. Maybe do and it of, later. And of course, you can do it also by API, and we do it usually also by API. But it's, for presentation, it's a little bit more visible if you if you see all the parameters in the in, in the UI. So let's let's create a second jump host. Of course, you already have one, but we can have um, another one. Um, usually, for a lot of machines, for for the staging instances and for the jump host, the smallest possible instance with one virtual CPU and one gigabyte of RAM is absolutely sufficient. And a server like this just costs around six euros if you have it the, the whole month uh, running. And for our staging systems, it isn't even necessary. By the way, you can also, use, you can also have Windows, but um, th then usually you get also license with it. And this, for the compute machines, it usually, for this compute one and compute two, it approximately doubles the price that you have per hour. It's an expensive hobby to have Windows as, as, as your operating system, looks like, at least in the public cloud. So I think we're already finished. Create the server. Looks good. OK. By the way, I'm just connected using my mobile phone because we have to use a very secure virtual private network software here. And it didn't work with the uh, network here. Yeah. So, as you can see, it is already the creating the, the server for us. Yeah. And, and, and Boris injected already all the scripts that are needed to build the Ansible master. So as soon as the machine starts now, and, uh, and um, we, will maybe, we may see this in the console, then it, 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 it even recompiles the Ansible things, because the Ansible things, the, the bad thing is that yeah. Ansible does not uh, the, the most current uh, distribution uh, uh, distributed by RPM packages or, 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 or APT packages. Yeah. So you have to recompile it if you really want to have all the open, step, open stack things in. And uh, it does even on boot the recompiling, yeah. the installation. It even, it even installs a small squid proxy, which is useful for certain scenarios where you don't have a public IP. And it's really our Swiss Army knife you know, so we, we yep. use for, for all kinds of, of continuous integration and continuous deployment, especially because it is um, idempotent. I, idempotent means if, if the, 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 the script run breaks, you can restart it at the point where it breaks and it repeats all the steps before in a, in a transparent way and, in, and without breaking anything which is really different than having pure scripts. So I can only recommend to use something like, like Ansible, maybe Puppet Chef. We have to use Ansible because Ansible is purely based on SSH and does not need an agent. Agent is a problem for systems of Deutsche Telekom because um, if you make a security audit, usually the first thing that the people say is, you install an agent on this image, this means you have another point where somebody can break into your system, so you have to explain exactly what to do there. If you use Ansible, we say, okay, we are using exactly the access you need to administer the machine, so why do you bother about my, my complete way to do automation here? Yeah? Yeah. And we are done with the security things. So the, the server has been created, so maybe we can continue. So this is the Elastic IP that we need for integrating it to, to, to Jenkins. But first, we need to, to run our, our magic script on the machine. i show you how we do this. Um, so here you have to select uh, the type of your keyboard, of your physical keyboard. So for me, it would be German. These are things you usually don't care about if you roll the thing out the first time. Yeah. This is the, the things that come in as soon as you really use the stuff that you need something to switch over the keyboards. God damn, I think I forgot something. Okay. Um, we did not upload the master script. 
Huh? I think we have to create a new one. <laughs> yeah, but I think the people believe that you can. Yeah. Have, yeah. Just take the just take the master that we have. Yeah. Okay. Last time, last time when I did a presentation on CBIT, the, 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 the way we, we, we do it now, um, I showed the console window and the customers came in and said, oh, did you, oh, do you have to, did you br break something? Um, what, what's, why does the machine not work? Something? And I said, it's just the automation console. It's something that you usually see if you administer the system. And you see that a lot of the, the, the IT responsibles uh, today are not any more aware that still the very basic console things and the very basic usage things you have in, you had in the past are still there and they are even get more important than in the than in the past because as soon as you rely on APIs as OpenStack does the user experience and the user interface is not the first person citizen in a, in a, uh, in the context anymore. The API is the first person citizen. And if the API is the first person citizen, it means you don't see anything which is blinking and nice and something like that. Maybe in a first or second release. Maybe late on, later on somebody does an UI on it. But the console, at least for the people who automate, is becoming again the, 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 the tool of choice. Okay, I just created another one, so this time I didn't forget to, to upload the script. In the meantime, we can have a look at, at the uh, Jenkins to show you some of the jobs. Um, so, for example, this would be um, a job that does the, the full deployment. We can uh, look at the uh, console output from, from the last run. So here you can see um, the, the Ansible script executing um, on the jump host on our Ansible master. Um, from this machine, we have the possibility not only to uh, very easily do a secure shell to the machine that we are currently staging, but we can also run other tools on it. Uh, for example, for, for testing the, the installation of the, of the web server. And this is only possible if you connect to the jump host because then you have the, the local um, access because the other machines are not exposed to the internet. So what you can see here, um, we're deleting the old instance, the old volume, the old port. Um, then a fresh volume is created, uh, a port. We put some DHCP options in it. Then the service created, the instance is started. Um, we wait for coming uh, that it comes available. Then the image is customized, um, installing another YUM repository, um, updating the, the RPMs. Um, what do we have? Then, of course, uh, the Apache is installed, some files copied to it. And at the end, everything is finished, um, servers up and running, and then we can uh, create the image from this server. You even do the firewall rules. This is an interesting thing because I've seen so many times the firewall rules running around in some Excel sheets and somebody does reconfigure the firewall and then the firewalls are, da are gone, the rules that you set before, and you have no connections anymore and you have a big incident in your environment. So it's, it is really a, a security improvement if you have all the, the things that you need to deploy, the, the uh, your, your system in one place and even in a, in a version control system to have it documented and have it repeatable. And you can always say it at each conference that this is the benefit, but you really feel the benefit if you do it. Okay, now everything should work, I guess. So another jump post, another login. There you go. Don't forget to change your password.
Sudo. Oh gosh, no, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I used the wrong one. The problem is, of course, um, that uh, we have different line endings here. So uh, we, we have to use the, the version with the line feeds at the Boris, end. Boris, go to the jump yeah. host that we have and show <laughs> the things that are really important. Okay. Anyway, we have the images uh, already built. So we can, uh, can uh, show the, the update, for example. So if currently this, this web page um, prepared for you. If you reload it, you see that uh, we have different local IPs here. So this would be another one. And we can now change it. So how would we do the, the, uh, the rolling update? We go to the auto scaling group. I use this one here. And I already prepared the, the uh, mm. oh, no, we do it now, okay, the configuration. We have built the image, we need a configuration. So you can see a list of uh, auto-scaling groups configurations that are based on different images. So 1.6 was the last image for, wa for what I created. Um, a configuration mm. here. Maybe, maybe a short word on auto scaling configuration. What you of course need when you make an auto scaling configuration is you have to say which image to start and how the server look like as soon as the, the, the auto scaler decides to create a new server. So you give him a full specification of a server that should be started as soon as upscaling is required. And you give him also rules how to how, when to downscale and how to downscale. And this is exactly what is Boris now configuring. <clears throat> so the autoscaler configuration, it's uh, a mix of um, the image and the flavor. So now we switch to the new. And the interesting thing is this is something that you don't have in the OpenStack API. But you can still handle it as in the same way as the OpenStack API. So if you have a keystone login and you created the, the server with the keystone login, you can use REST calls with the same keystone token, which look even the same as they are look for OpenStack, but they do the thing like add a server to the load balancer or add a rule to the, to the, uh, to the autoscaler configuration. And this is the way we do all the, the platform as a service things that we are doing on this, on this platform by simply extending the, the, the APIs where a standard service is not available yet. But um, we're doing it that you can do it really in the same way. And we are, we are working at the moment to, do, to encapsulate these things also in proper libraries if necessary. We have already some small tooling like the OTC, uh, such, such small OTC tool you can use for it, but um, it's, for Ansible you need this, this thing with the item potency. So now of course you have to wait for the uh, new instances to, <coughs> to come up. So what you can see here, we have those two instances, the old ones, which are running on the old configuration, which is uh, using the, the old uh, image version as well. And these are the new instances that are currently um, created based on the new um, configuration. Boris, how can, you, how, how can I find out that's the new one? Um, I, I changed the, changed the background color here. Ah, so okay. we have the, the red color at the moment, which is served from the uh, two instances based on the, the old image. So how does it work? Of course, we're now adding the new instances. And at the end, when everything is fine, we just remove the, the old ones. And there are several steps that can be used for doing this. You can just modify the number of um, expected instances, for example. Uh, you could also manually call um, We're the policy. Out of time. Yeah. So give us, give us the last two slides. So I, ho I hope we can give you at least a small flavor of how the things really work on the, on the OTC. It's difficult to, to, to make in, in, in 40 minutes the, the, the whole scripting and, and stuff like that. But 
And if you're interested and you want to have a chat and maybe even want to see the scripts, um, of course, yes. come we can to the, do everything come to in the depth booth. We can, more we can play around. We, we, we make even some other things. We, make, we, we can even crash the platform if you want to, no problem. Uh, so um, yeah, come to us. We'll play around. We are downstairs at the booth. Um, contact us. These are, the, these are the coordinates you can find us. And get the vouchers. We have 250 euro vouchers to try out the, the, the platform, at least for, for the, the people who, can, who have, you're in the area of Europe. We have, to, we have things there. So come here or come to the booth and get, uh, yeah, get the vouchers. Thank you. Sorry that we do not have time left for questions. Oh, but the new if you have questions, come running. here or come to the booth. Okay, perfect. Thank you. But we can try it. Ah, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> it's working. So you, now you see the, the old uh, image and the new image. They are running uh, both at the same time. We have uh, four machines that answer. And the new ones have this uh, magenta background. And the two old instances, they are still delivering the, the red uh, background. Rolling update, nearly finished, so we just have to kick to out kick the, out the, the old, old machines. machines. Yeah, yes. then, it's, then it's done. And you can do it. And, and really, it's, it's something that's live already out there. We have done it. We have a reference customer, but we are not allowed to give, to give the name. It's a broadcast company, public broadcast in Germany. And they've done it this way, and it has already bulletproof. It's, yeah. Thank you.